Here. James Spears? Here. And Jimmy Zuckley? Here. Did I say that right? Zelke. Zelke, I'm That's sorry. Okay. That's okay. Okay, we have a quorum. I want to thank you all for being here. First item on our agenda is, well, before we get started, I want to welcome Christine Reif. She's our new assistant for uh, the advisory board meeting. We appreciate all you're doing for <coughs> us. And she has asked that um, if you make a motion, would you please state your name before you make the motion and make it very specific while she's learning our names and everything. So um, any motions, state your name and make it very specific. We're gonna go to the approval of the minutes. Um, the copy you have in front of you had a slight change from what was emailed to you just describing an agenda item on one of the uh, last paragraphs is all, the only change that was made instead of referencing the agenda item by letter we described it so do we have any uh, corrections or changes to this <coughs> do I have a motion to approve the minutes Amy Milstead I make a motion to approve the minutes you have a second James Spears second all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motions approved. Uh, the minutes are approved as presented. Thank you. Our next uh, item on the agenda is public comment. <clears throat> and I'd like to ask anybody here who wants to make a public comment, please fill out the form that is over at the desk and turn it in to me and you can do your public comment. We limit the comments to three minutes. And our first one is Chris Lawson. Would you like to come up and make your public comment? Hi, my name is Chris Lawson. I'm here from Admiral Enforcement, uh, based out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, we operate a um, booting company in the city of Austin. Uh, and we were just wanting some clarification on what the time frame is from the city taking this over from TDLR. Um, as far as uh, last we were told, um, it's going to go to city council. City council will look at it, uh, render a decision, and another meeting would be forthcoming from that to where the booting companies, the towing companies would give their say um, where they could comment on um, items such as the, the max boot fee <coughs> or, or whatever. So we were just kind of wanting to know a time frame or, or um, we were told September, um, October, so um, in the decision might not be made yet, but we just wanted some clarification. Okay, well, welcome to Austin. Thanks for coming all the way from New Orleans. But I just want to explain something to you. We're not allowed to discuss anything in public comments because it's not on our actual published agenda. But I'm sure there's some, uh, Todd Forrester could probably answer your questions okay. during a break. Sure. Okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Madam Chair, I have a question. Jeanette mm -hmm. Rash. I think it's on the agenda. It's the booting that we're we're striking. Am I? Is that, is that, I mean, I'm just inquiring. Uh -huh. I think that's probably what he's referring. To. Uh, it sounded more like a local city question. <laughs> well, the city will start regulating booting after TDLR does away with mm -hmm. it. So I, I, that's why I assumed it. So that, okay, I thank you for that. For. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, when we get to that discussion, yeah, we'll go over that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ken Ulmer, would you like to come? Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak before you guys today. Um, my name is Ken Ulmer, and I op operate a towing and storage facility in Houston, a fairly high volume <laughs> facility. I'm also the chairman of the City of Houston Automotive Board, and in that position on the Automotive Board, our <coughs> Not solely purpose, but a big part of our purpose is to protect consumers, and that's really what I'm here to speak about today. Um, and it has been the source of lots of contention in the past, but that's the VSF 011 form. Um, and there's several things that I'd like to say about it. Um, for one, it causes probably more problems than just about any other form that we deal with or have. We consecutively have consumers that wind up at our storage facility wanting to pick up their personal belongings, whether that be, you know, garage door openers or checkbooks in the glove compartment. And we tell them every day, sorry, your car's already gone. 
um, and they're in shock. They're like, why is my car gone? Who would have picked my car up? I thought no one can pick up my car. And we pull out this form, print out a copy. It has but become such a problem until we now use scanned images of this form so that we can easily print it out and don't have to go pull it from the file. That's how often we give one out to a consumer. And the consumer looks at the form and goes, I don't even know this person. What, why, how can they authorize the release of my vehicle? And I explain to them it's a state form and that this form allows an insurance company to basically state that they have spoken to them and have permission to pick their car up. <clears throat> The problems I've got with the form, number one, um, I truly believe that as an owner of vehicles myself, I would want to personally sign a form that released my vehicle. Um, and this, doesn't, this form doesn't facilitate that at all. The other couple of issues that I have with it is, number one, I can't tell the consumer where their vehicle went. This form doesn't tell me where that vehicle went. I can only tell them the towing company that picked their vehicle up or the insurance company that authorized that release. So when they say, well, where is my car? Where are my belongings? I go, I'm sorry, I don't have any idea. And they go, well, who can I contact? And I say, I'm sorry, I don't have a phone number for them either. There's not a phone number on the form. Um, so I essentially send them back to their insurance company. In a lot of cases, this is a third party insurance. So they may be involved in a claim and it's not even their insurance company that picked up the vehicle. And this happens frequently. I mean, when I say frequently, I mean several times a week. It's become such an issue that we now have a printed out form that we hand the people to say, look, this is what you probably need to do if you want to do something about it. The other part is when I print this form out and hand it to a consumer, if you read down at the bottom, it tells them to contact an attorney before signing this a form. So I'm assuming a consumer, if they had a question about this form, would contact their attorney. Doesn't tell them who to complain to, gives them a TDLR, some TDLR, a TDLR website, but typically a consumer is not going to complain to TDLR about their vehicle being picked up on one of these forms. So I think it should have some complaint information. Probably Texas Department of Insurance would be the right place for that claim information to go. Um, and, and I really, for the life of me, I can't understand why we would protect all these things for consumers and then leave this completely unchanged for the length of time that it has. We all know that it's been a problem. Um, we accept these forms in fax form. We accept them by email there's no reason a consumer can't sign this form. I would not want my vehicle picked up at a vehicle storage facility. The biggest thing that's troubling to me is, as a vehicle storage facility, I'm fully regulated. So at my facility, they know they have insurance. They know there's someone there to get their vehicle 24 hours a day if there were medication left in it or something along those lines. When their vehicle leaves, it's a complete owner consent situation. Doesn't have to be in a regulated VSF. The, the fees are not regulated, where their vehicle is, the towing companies that pick it up in most cases are consent tow companies. Not to say they're not safe, but where they're taking the vehicle, who knows? I mean, you don't have any idea. Um, I have also heard lots of horror stories from those consumers when the insurance company said, well, you know what, we're going to pay you a total loss claim, but you got to get your car if you want to keep it. And it's at this VSF, typically a salvage pool, and you need to pay the fees there. And I've heard lots of consumers tell me that those fees are very, very large, much larger than any VSF. So those are my complaints with the form. Um, I don't think these are any new complaints. We've heard these complaints for a long time. Uh, I definitely see the value in the form. I definitely feel like consumers need this form. I just don't feel like it does a good job of identifying who did what. Um, you know, we. Typically, it's not uncommon for us to have the police department out there and go, why did you release this car? And we pull out a VSF form and go, this is why. That's it. That's all we've got. And in a lot of cases, it is a supposed owner or family member who has falsified something. Um, that happens pretty frequently as well. So I just think that the form needs some work to make sure that consumers are being protected. That's really what our job is all about, is to protect consumers. Um, and I don't think we're doing a real good job of that with this form. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <coughs> Our next item uh, on the agenda is staff reports from licensing. <coughs> Good afternoon, board members. Um, the staff report that you have looks a lot like the last one I gave because it practically is. Our third quarter numbers weren't ready by the time this report was needed to be submitted. Um, so for the next time, I'll have more updated numbers. Um, what is updated is the tow company and tow truck population information on the first page. That is as of May 25th, 2018. Um, so that information was updated from the last time. 
Um, we don't have anything new as far as numbers go. Um, we did redes not redesign, but um, our forms page for the tow companies and vehicle storage facilities. We made it a little bit, a little bit easier because they, all the forms were listed just all together, so we categorized them. So now it's tow company forms, vehicle okay. storage facility forms, and then other forms that a person may need when they apply if they need anything additional. So that okay. is something new on our web on our tow web page. Um, I have a question on the mm -hmm. tow truck population, mm -hmm. which um, I didn't notice last time. The tow truck population is down over 3,000 trucks. Has anybody looked at that to see what's going on with that? Or <coughs> from, oh, from, from the, the end of 2017 to till now? Um, I, I, what I think is, is that um, I don't have, I need to look at it better, but when I looked at it the last time, um, I think some of them were taken out um, at the end of the fiscal year 2017 um, due to um, all the all the the tow companies were were twice were added twice because there's about 3,000 or so 4,000 tow companies but I mean the numbers have grown consistently since 2014 yeah yeah I in think 2016 they were right there oh. almost the same as 2017 and then the, we have a 3,000 truck drop Right, and I think it's because the tow companies and tow trucks were being added together, which that should just be tow trucks. Oh, so it's about I see what four thousand. So, so the numbers are no good, right? They, because because they were adding them, they were duplicating oh, a number in there, okay. and so when we went back, it it's a more reflection of the true numbers. Because if you look at the total tow trucks right underneath it, where we break down the the, the company and the tow truck, um, the little. Mm -hmm. So that, the total trucks is 11,384, and the tow companies is 4,015. <coughs> so it would have been, they were, at, they were being added together in on the, the previous report. years. Not on the in report. the sy licensing right. system. Right, just on this report. Gotcha, okay. So we went back and looked at it, I realized that the tow companies was being, were, were being added into the tow truck population. Okay, would it be difficult to correct that? For the next meeting, sure, sure. I can definitely that do that. Awesome. No yeah, problem. just so we'd have a you know better idea of the trend. So because right. that shocked me. Yeah, absolutely. I can okay, very good. Okay, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I have, I have a question, Janine uh -huh. Brash. Does this number uh, in 2017 include the? I think it was 1,600 plus few of the out-of-state tow operators that were brought in by the insurance company during after the hurricane. Yes. Maybe that's part of it. Uh, well, the because they probably are, wouldn't renew. Yeah, the tr the tow trucks and the the tow companies mm -hmm. weren't treated dif differently if so they were from out of state. It. No, so that's they were the same. right there. Yeah, they were the okay. same. They're not treated. They're not marked differently than you. any of the other tow companies okay. that are usually licensed here in Texas. So that we would have sixteen hundred out of state tow trucks in that 14,470 right. number is right. what you're saying. That were added on additionally during the, for the, hurricane. For the hurricane, right. But the, right. since those are not designated any differently, they don't have a special emergency of tow license, they're just counted in with all the tow companies because their license is still good for a year. The chair and I do have a concern because insurance rates are putting towers out of business. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be watching that very carefully okay. if we can track it and make sure and see what's going on within the industry and be helpful. Yeah, we can do that. We can Thank do you. a special one for emergency ones also. Thank well. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything, anything else? else? Any other questions, Board? Yeah. Thank you very much for your information. Next up is customer service. Good afternoon, Chairman, Board members. Misty Maldonado de Leon, I'm the manager for the tow industry and customer service. Here to just report statistics, um, if you could look at the report, you could see a trend of uh, our contacts going up, I guess starting for the summer months coming up. Um, that's pretty much all I had to report. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Questions, board? Thank you very yes. much. You're welcome. Hurricane. 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 
people looking for their cars. Enforcement division. He's smiling. <laughs> I like the smile. <laughs> Ron Foster, I'm a senior prosecutor in the enforcement division. Um, I'm here today filling in for Michael Shirk, one of our prosecutors on, on the tow program. He's stuck in Houston. His car broke down, from what I understand, and he couldn't get here. <laughs> so I here I am trying to present uh, his report, okay? Um, should be a fairly familiar type of report. As you'll see, you've got some case highlights on it at the beginning, and we're going to have some statistics in this, and it looks like they also have a list of uh, some of the top ten violations that you have in this program. In your case highlights, um, it looks like he gave you a mix of uh, interesting cases in here. I'll note that some of these are default orders. Uh, a couple of them are agreed orders. And the first one, though, that we're going to look at, I think is very interesting. It looks like a contested case that had a negotiated settlement on it, the Black Bull towing. And what you see is that this went actually to the State Office of Administrative Hearings where it was contested. Um, the judge actually made a proposal for decision. And between the judge making the proposal for decision and the commission making the final order, the parties came together and agreed on a <coughs> different, slightly different resolution. And that resolution, as you can see, uh, included a $10,400 fine with a refund of fees, a one-year suspension that was probated for two years. This is uh, probably a little bit better off for the business owner than what would have happened with the $9,200 penalty under the PFD and a full uh, two-year suspension of operations, which would have basically not allowed you to have, be in business during that time. Um, I think it's very reasonable to have these kind of negotiated settlements in certain situations, especially when you have large penalties. You it, Basically, you take away a person's ability to be able to pay a fine when you take them out of business at the same time. So <coughs> in this situation, it looks like the parties agreed that it was better for this person to continue operating, pay a large fine, make good with the customers, and be on probation for a couple of years. So that looks like the resolution of this particular Black Bull matter. Um, the next, I'm looking at uh, CFC recycling. Looks like a default order was issued. If you're familiar with default orders, it means we sent out notices to the individual. They just didn't respond to us. We usually send out another notice to them to tell them, hey, we're serious. We're going to go forward on this case. If you don't respond to us, they didn't respond to us, we issue a default order. That looks like a $6,000 penalty that got issued on that one, unlicensed tow truck driver and didn't maintain uh, the required insurance that you're supposed to. Uh, I saw that on a couple of these cases, failing to maintain the insurance, so I, it seems to be a recurring issue. Uh, case number three also, uh, Barbara A. Carmona, DBA, Rios Towing. It was another default order, again, $7,100 penalty. You know, I'll make a note that the penalties, they tend to be a little bit higher when you have a default against you because what that means is you didn't have an opportunity to discuss the settlement negotiations with the department. We generally encourage our prosecutors to try to <coughs> reach a settlement with individuals, and it usually results in a reduced penalty that will be assessed, or even perhaps some kind of evidence being provided to one of the prosecutors that there were corrective <coughs> actions taken, and when those corrective actions are taken, the prosecutor will take that in consideration and perhaps lower the penalty, or perhaps it demonstrates that one of the allegations is n not true and you can withdraw that allegation. Nevertheless, if you don't respond at all, you, you lose all those opportunities and so the penalties tend to be a little bit higher. Um, on uh, the next case, the Trinity towing case, you see it's an agreed order. That means just the opposite, right? The party had an opportunity to provide evidence of corrective actions. They reached an agreement with um, the prosecutor on the case. I'm not sure who exactly were the prosecutors on each individual case. We have uh, three different prosecutors in this program assigned to the tow uh, vehicle storage facilities program. So um, in any case, one of the prosecutors uh, man, uh, negotiated a $15,000 uh, penalty on this case. It involved non-consent tows that were taken to locations other than licensed uh, storage facilities. It looks like there was also um, violation for drug and alcohol testing. Didn't um, didn't implement the test testing program as you required, and also there were some uh, unlicensed uh, tow truck drivers. So I mean, these are all pretty serious violations in my estimation. 
uh, agreed order uh, on the Trinity Vehicle Storage Facility case as well. It looks like an $8,100 um, penalty was assessed against the respondent. Um, looks like there were failures to send notice letters. As you know, I mean, uh, just like we send out notices and we're required to do it by law, uh, they're required to send out notices and first and second notices. It looks like they didn't do that. Um, let's see, charging an impound fee and either failing to perform or failing to adequately document services that were performed. And uh, also employing unlicensed person. Anytime there's an un uh, unlicensed activity, it's serious in each one of our programs. It doesn't matter which one it is. So um, not having the training, the experience, or the education to be able to do something, it's very important. So we're always going to pursue that type of situation. The last case that you see on there is the Paul Taylor and Taylor Towing and Storage. Um, very significant agreed order, again, that was reached on this case. It looks like a $30,000 administrative penalty against a tow company and another 30000 against a storage facility. Um, the the indications are that there was failure to maintain the insurance coverage, uh, failure to have that drug testing policy. It says that this is a, there were multi-year violations, so of course that's significant because a one-time instance of a violation is less of a concern than something that goes on egregiously for months and months and years and years in this case. And it says this is the respondent's third violation, so this isn't their first time at the rodeo. They've had more than one opportunity to try to learn how to do things right, and they've basically not done that. So the penalties, uh, they do increase significantly as you get first, second, third violations, and that's what's happened here. Excuse me, Ron. Yes. I just want to make the department aware that his son was killed in an accident Saturday at an yeah. accident scene in Leaf City. Yeah, I'm very I sorry to hear that. that. Y'all, whether y'all knew that or not. Yeah. So irregardless of the situation Of course, here, and I personally, I'm not that familiar with the individuals yeah. in this program, but that's always a sad thing to hear. And of course. Are there any other comments or questions about any of the cases that I just spoke about? I really don't have a lot of intimate personal knowledge about the individual cases, but I'll be happy to get you any further details that you may, uh, may be wondering about them. The, the synopsis is there just to give you an idea of what types of cases we're seeing in prosecution. If not, I'll, the, you'll see the key statistics. Um, these two, uh, the towing and vehicle storage facilities always drive a signif significant number of cases for us. Um, in both of these programs, you see that there were more cases uh, that were resolved and that were actually open. So that normally indicates to me that there's a little bit of a backlog that my prosecutors are working through. We always have cases coming in through ins um, inspections and consumer complaints. So it's not unusual that there would be more cases um, that were resolved because there's cases being closed that were either insufficient evidence or perhaps there were warnings issued. They don't all end up with the final order of a penalty. There's a lot of times there are corrective actions that are taken that are satisfactory to the prosecutor and you, don't, you can close the case or you can issue a warning. So uh, nevertheless, there were uh, 889 of the cases were open for tow, 261 for VSF. You had uh, more than 1,000 that were uh, resolved in the tow and about 350 or so in the VSF. Penalties assessed, penalties collected, as you are probably very well aware, you don't nearly collect all of the amounts that we assess, uh, some, especially on the default orders. It's difficult um, when the individual uh, uh, gets that order, a lot of times they're, they're just non-compliant across the board and they're not going to pay a fine, so you end up having to go to the, through the AG's office or a bill collector to collect on that, and it really just depends upon the amount. Generally amounts over 5000 we go to the AG's office, and less than that, we go through a bill collector type of person <laughs> to, to try to collect on that. But um, it looks, you know, uh, the, the rates may not seem very high, but it looks to me about typical, almost a quarter of what, and that's, that, that's actually about typical in a lot of the programs of what we can collect on those. On the uh, agreed orders, you tend to collect a lot better because a person's trying to stay in a positive status with the, the department, trying to keep their license or trying to stay on that probated suspension and not go in arrears. So they're going to pay uh, and they're going to keep up, up to date on their payments. So we do collect a, uh, quite a bit higher on the agreed orders. Um, there's a statistic in here. I hadn't seen this one in other programs. It's uh, average penalty. It looks like for towing, the average penalty for fiscal year 2018 so far has been about $3,200 and in VSF it's about $2,900.
Um, then you have, lastly, some of the top ten violations that, that the prosecutors are seeing. Um, looks like that failed to maintain insurance is right there at the top. Um, it's pretty serious because I would guess if you're towing someone's vehicle and you don't have insurance and something goes wrong, uh, I don't know what the recourse is then for the consumer on that. Um, towing without authorities, illegal tows, that happens quite a bit. Um, the VSFs, it looks like uh, not including required information on the notices and not sending the notices are the two big issues that are happening in that program. That concludes the report. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you for coming right, in thank for you. Michael. Hope he makes it back to Austin. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> Education and Examination Division. Good afternoon, Madam um, Chairman, board members. My name is John Schildwalker. I'm with the Education Examination Division. I'm here to present our key statistics uh, for this past quarter up through May, um, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Madam Chair, Jeanette? I'm really concerned. We've lost two tow operators in about three weeks, one on 99 and then the one in Leak City, uh, Paul Taylor, Jr. I was wondering if there's a way to track the number that are taking Sharp 2, the uh, strategic highway training that Federal Highway offers that can be there four hours. Would there be a way that we could track to see how many are actually taking that maybe? Uh, Kim Witt with Education. We can look into that for you. After the meeting, I'll get some information from you and we'll see what I, we can I do. I really would appreciate sure. that. Okay. Sad. Yeah. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Regulatory program management. RPM. <coughs> <laughs> Ooh, get all three of you guys. I know. I'm saying we're in trouble here. <laughs> 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 Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and advisory board members. I'm Lee Parham. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Regulatory Program Management Division, formerly known as Compliance. Uh, we, on, at your April 10th meeting, you were introduced to the new division, the new RPM division. Uh, David Gonzalez is our new uh, division director. And uh, Charlotte Melder, has been selected as the section manager for the business and consumer safety section. Now that was, that was June 15th. That was the official handoff date of towing vehicle storage and UAPR from me to Charlotte. Uh, she has management experience and over, she's been with us for almost 10 years as a prosecutor as well as a, a senior prosecutor. So with that said, uh, Charlotte's going to be the new section manager. I'm going to turn everything over to Todd and Latasha. So to be clear, okay. Charlotte's taking your place? It, basically. Your basically. Uh, towing vehicles. I'm confused. <laughs> okay. <laughs> towing. If I could interject, Carla James, TDLR. Okay. It's, we have moved the managers around, not the staff. So you're still going to have your key personnel in, in the area. So Todd and Latasha aren't going anywhere. Um, Charlotte has been working on tow cases and been very involved with the tow and VSF and booting <coughs> industry and as an enforcement attorney. So it was a natural progression for her to move into that area because she's already very well versed in it. And I think we're keeping Lee on his toes by giving him tons of other stuff and him being deputy director now in the division. So we've just done some shifting of management, but you'll keep your key personnel for um, your subject matter experts. I'm, st I'm still, I'm still going to be around uh, no. towing. You're not leaving? No, 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 no. No, I'll still be around. It's okay. not getting out that easy. No, <laughs> they wouldn't let me. Okay. Thank you for the update. 
Good afternoon, I'm Todd Forrester with the Regulatory Program Management Division. Our trainings are, uh, we are doing and an looking at creating an online training. It is almost finished. It has been a lot of work to uh, condense all the information down. I'm looking at having several modules, if you will, about various topics. Um, we, we also want to incorporate a webinar-based uh, training for these, but that's kind of secondary to just getting it complete. It's tough because it, it takes a lot of time, and with the other, um, the other work we have to do sometimes, it, it has to take a back seat. But uh, we are almost done with that, and we hope to have that completed by the end of this month and look at <coughs> webinar and implementing it next month or, or the month after, depending on what else we have going on. Uh, we will also be at the TOE show coming up in August, where we will provide a training on Friday, and then we'll speak awesome. on Sunday. Um, so come out, and we'll, we should have a table, and feel free to ask any questions you have. And uh, we are looking at additional trainings. We're working with the associations on seeing when and where we can get those. Very good. That's awesome. Very good. And I think you're supposed to bring Nick with you this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Carla, if you want to pass that along. Well, actually, I think Carla. Uh, we're peers. I'd be coming? happy to let Todd pass that along. <laughs> He, uh, he was so disappointed last year when he had to cancel on us, so. <laughs> Hello, Madam Chair, Hi, Tasha. board members, I'm LaFosha Polin. Um, I'm going to speak on our internal efforts. Um, the regulatory program management section has scheduled a training with our customer service division uh, for late July. Uh, this training will just be over laws and rules and um, accurate information going out to the customers and letting them know how we can assist them, you know, in any way possible. That's Very all I good. have. Do you have any questions for us? There's been some um, questions on licensing and testing and training. If we could, I think they get a lot of calls on that. Yeah. And there's a lot of confusion on that, so that would be a good area to focus on. Okay. Too. Okay. That works. Thanks. I'm going to be the person facilitating that, so <coughs> okay. uh, I'll good. do that. Any other questions? Right. We Thank appreciate you, you guys, yes, everything yes. you do. Field inspections is next. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Tanya Guthrow, uh, the Director of Field Inspections. And uh, the first part of our report is changed a little bit. Last time we had a meeting, you guys had some questions about how frequently certain violations were written. So if you look at the first <coughs> item here, it's for tow companies and it says the most common violations found during inspections. Now, this is for the second quarter of this fiscal year which starts in September. And I just kind of highlighted so you could remember back to those total numbers. So we did a total of 390 tow company inspections and 493 tow truck inspections during that period of time. And if you look at each item, the first one, vehicle signage, you'll see that number 72. So that means that that was written 72 times. But if you look at the second item, you'll see that that was written 63 times. <clears throat> but also note that it has a little asterisk that says reported to enforcement. So unless the item says it's reported to enforcement, it is a fix on site, yeah. fix on your own without a report kind of violation. Okay, and for those listening that don't have it in front of them. <laughs> it's a little complicated. The vehicle yeah. signage is just a correctable violation. That, that is That was correct. the number one violation was yeah. 72 written up. Yes. Number two was alcohol and drug testing of tow operators. That's, That's the correct. number two violation was 63 written up, mm -hmm. and that is reportable to enforcement. That is correct, and only in certain cases. So it's not always reportable. So there are lots Depends of opportunities for people to go ahead and get that fixed. Um, and the other thing to note is that even though you might see that number 72 and then 63 on the second item, you can't just add them together because it's possible that one inspection resulted in a violation for 
vehicle signage as well as the alcohol and drug testing violation. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a straight correlation there. Okay. Okay. Very good. And it's Thank really you just. For that extra information. Oh, you're very welcome. And it's just written for each one of the uh, top in uh, the top violations. We went all the way to number 11 for tow and VSF, I'm uh, tow uh, and tow trucks, and then of course we did the same thing for vehicle storage facilities. Same kind of thing you're going to see uh, on the reports, which are available online. Um, uh, I wanted to, to point out that the reference guide is available online and it does also list which of those violations are direct to enforcement. So okay. all this information is available uh, as part of the reference guide. It's just the things that we check for. Very good. Okay. Very good. Um, I'd also like to just summarize a little bit that even though you don't see this on your report, Approximately 5% of the inspections resulted in a, an enforcement report for the tow or tow truck inspections. And for a vehicle storage facility, it was about 15%. Okay? Just want to give you a little summary of okay. what we're talking about. And remember that if the prosecutor gets the report, then they have an opportunity to work with the licensee to talk about the situation, get more information, and potentially, you know, mm -hmm. discuss the situation with them. Our next item is um, just a reminder about tow truck roundups. We had one in Houston in April, on April the 9th, and at the time of this report, we were mentioning the June 2nd uh, tow truck roundup that we actually had right out here in our parking lot. <laughs> Uh, and I want to thank Commissioner Wesson and Brian Francis for coming by. It was a long day, and you'll get those numbers uh, in our next report because we, they weren't ready at the time that we submitted this to you. Um, also, I want to say welcome to Sharon Hollins, who's one of the field inspectors that we hired in the DFW area, and say congratulations to Jennifer Harless, who is now the Strategic Response Coordinator for the RPM Division. Uh, and I have actually replaced her by hiring Fernando Reyes um, to be our South Region Manager. So we're doing another round of hirings, and it seems the kind of thing we always do, but uh, we'll update you further Very as we good. know more. Very good. Any questions, Board? Any questions? Madam Chair, I just wanted to say that the VSS have 44 sign violations. We can <laughs> ever deal with them. I don't because know how to when Ron it. did the report, there yeah. was not one, which is good because they didn't yes. enforce it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we really accomplished something here. I know. And then well. I get to talk, it's 44. <laughs> this is true, but, you know, it <laughs> is the kind of thing. They don't go to enforcement. Yeah. I know. So that's good. 44. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know. to me, that's uh, our signs. The, it's complicated. It's complicated. And it's not. All the time. I well, know. Even when we don't change that's it, there, there's like, they're in six different places I know. in the statute and the I rules. Know. Yeah. How do yeah. you, you know, we just need to clean that up and get them all together. And, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I know. Uh, it's still an ongoing struggle. We'll keep going forward. We'll keep Thank trying. Um, and then our last item is the inspe inspection statistics. Um, but that concludes our reports, unless you have any other questions or comments. Anything? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Sure. Okay, Ms. Carla, we've got executive office. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I believe you all have a copy of our beautiful strategic plan in front of you. Um, as, as way of a little bit of background, all state agencies are required to go through the strate strategic planning process once every two years, and um, we, we take a, a specific interest in that process here at TDLR, and we go around the state and, and speak to folks. We had 8,000 comments through our survey and insight strategic planning. Uh, this year and so what happens to that information is it gets segregated out into buckets legislative changes that need to be made um, program changes rule changes what have you and so what you have before you is the final product this is given to the legislature and some of the legislative agencies 
and it's basically us telling the legislature what we see coming up in the next few years. It also includes information on the items that we see are uh, either problematic or just need changing and it so that is our basically blueprint going forward into the next legislative session so that's near the back of the plan it, you can look and see that we do not have anything planned for <coughs> tow or v, VSF so going forward if stuff comes across as we go through session we'll of course be monitoring it we will testify at hearings as necessary but we have not <coughs> excuse me designated any um, burning items that have to be dealt with on a legislative basis in this product so the next step is uh, we put together a legislative appropriations request which goes hand in hand with this document and prepare for the upcoming session in January and if you haven't been through that with us, it is an interesting ride. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised there's nothing on here for towing because 3,000 of those comments were ours out of those 8,000, um, right? Didn't everybody comment? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, and, and it, I'm sure we got a lot of comments. I don't know that any of them were consistent enough with a large number enough to address any hot burning issues in the towing VSF industry that were um, consistent enough across the board because what we're looking for is chunks of right. comments that address <coughs> all kinds of things. Um, we had a, a four-page single space document that listed all the legislative items and we had to pare it down from there. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't just us going out in the state. We also had a lot of comments internally from our staff saying, hey, this doesn't make sense. Why are we making them do this? Why are we making them do that? So a lot of that stuff has been incorporated as well. But um, what, we are, what we are seeing some is a bit of a pattern from our newer programs coming in. We had 13 new programs that came in from the Department of State Health Services over the last two years. And so we, we were seeing a bit of a trend in those programs to, to do some, mm -hmm. some modification to what we had. Since we've had towing in VSF for some time, um, this is not a surprise to me to see more of a movement towards some discussions related to our new, newer programs versus our, our older programs. Well, just a message to all those listening and the towers in the audience. They listen. We need to, you know, make sure we comment next time on some of our issues that we have. So they do rise to the top and there are chunks and we can't sit back and expect someone else to do it. Everybody's responsible and uh, that's just my little lecture today. <laughs> That's all I have on the strategic plan, ma'am. Okay. Anything else from executive office? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next item <clears throat> on the agenda is uh, discussion of public comments and possible recommendation of presentation for commission approval on proposed amendments to Chapter 86, Vehicle Towing Program, which this will be our relocation rules. That's correct. Uh, we're going to tackle two chapters today. The first will be chapter 86. This is Elizabeth Salina Strip Matter, Assistant General Counsel, and also present at the table with me is Todd Forrester from RPM. I apologize. That's my phone. Thank you. Um, so the last time we met, we talked about the, the proposed uh, relocate rules that we are going to add into chapter 86. Uh, we filed our proposal on April 23rd to the Texas Register and they were published on May 4th. We did not receive one single comment on the rules. Um, so given that, we were prepared to proceed to ask today for a, a recommendation to proceed to commission adoption. However, before that happened, uh, we recognized with the help of Joanne that there was some language that was inadvertently left out, must have fallen out during the many redrafts that we had on these particular rules. And the language that was left out was creating an exception for the 72-hour notice rule for um, emergencies involving threat of imminent danger to property. Um, so that has been inadvertently dropped. The two options that we have are as follows. We can um, withdraw. You can make a motion to withdraw the rules as published. We can go back and reinsert the language and we can talk about proposed language and settle on that language as you'd like to see it. We can refile with the Texas Register. It will have to go through the reviews again internally 
we can refile with the Texas Register, and we can reopen for public comment. I cannot give you a time frame on when we may be able to do that, but I can tell you that we will try to do it as soon as possible. The second other option is to go move forward and send what was published as written to the Commission for approval. Um, the uh, effective date would be September 1. We could not reopen to reinsert, to do a, rule a new rulemaking process to bring in the new language that was inadvertently dropped out until on or after September 2nd. And that is because we cannot reopen rules until they have been clo closed by the effective, by the, by the rules that are on the table going into effect. So you essentially would have to wait un several months to be able to reopen to insert the language. My recommendation would be that we withdraw, we insert the language that was inadvertently left out, we republish, and then hopefully we come back later this summer and we're able to then send to the commission and it may or may not be before September 1st of 2018. Now, the statutory, um, the bills that are commanding us to make the rules don't have an adoption by deadline. It just says as soon as practical. So we would not be in violation of any mandate by the state legislature to adopt by a certain date. Um, and as soon as practical could really mean anything and it could take into consideration the fact that there was an inadvertent omission and we couldn't do it sooner than whatever the date winds up being. So I will um, let you all discuss that, but um, before we discuss that, I wanted to make a proposal for reinserting the, I wanted to float some language to you that we could reinsert into 86.705. And where I see we can do it is 86.705N1 it currently reads, signs complying with this section are installed on the parking facility a minimum of 72 hours preceding relocation. I would propose um, that we could do something along the lines of, except in case of an emergency involving threat of imminent danger to property, signs complying with this section are installed on the parking facility a minimum of 72 hours preceding relocation. Could you read that again? Yes except in case of an emergency involving threat of imminent danger to property, signs complying with this section are installed on the parking facility a minimum of 72 hours preceding relocation. To me, that's the most logical place to put that language, um, but of course it's up to you and you all are free to discuss it. That sounds like it would take care of what we need. And Kyle? Sounds yes. good to you. Would you like to make a motion? Um, is there any discussion? I, I kind of like withdrawing and doing it cleanly, doing everything together in one shot. Anybody else have any discussion on that or opinion? Do we have a specific motion? I make I'm, a motion that we withdraw and resubmit. Is okay. That? Jeanette makes a motion that we withdraw and resubmit. <laughs> with this with proposed this language, language. right? Yes. Do we have a second? I'll second. Kyle Jackson. Kyle Jackson seconded. <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <coughs> Wonderful. And again, we apologize for the inadvertent omission. Um, this was a hard one. Well, you this know, we had so many, one. we've had so many drafts of this going yeah. back and forth and at some point it fell out and unfortunately none of us caught it. So, yeah, this, um, but again, very important, as you just said, bouncing off of what you said when these come up for publication, important for the industry to take a close look yes. at the rules yes. um, and make sure that the rules are encompassing everything that, that you want or that you need. Um, and if not, make a public comment so we can discuss it here. Yes, those public comments are valuable. We read those and we oftentimes make changes. That's right. Well, we did the last, during the last round of rulemaking, uh -huh. we made some so, changes in response to public um, comments. Don't be so. complacent. We, everything is considered. Yes. Everything is considered. Absolutely. Okay, are we ready for the next one? We are ready for the next one. Discussion and possible recommendation of presentation for commission approval on the proposed repeal of Chapter 89 vehicle booting and immobilization program. This one is, I think, pretty clear, pretty clean, and it may um, answer some questions that the gentleman during public comment um, asked. Um, this one relates to the deregulation of vehicle booting um, and, and immobilization, which was mandated by the last legislature to occur by September 1. 
So what we have done is we have essentially gone in and looked at our chapter, our, which is chapter 89 for the rules relating to booting, and we have struck everything because it's being deregulated. Um, the last time that we discussed, you all were fine with striking everything. There were no uh, comments or concerns that I remember. Uh, we published in the Texas Register on May 4th of 2018 and again received no comments. Okay. Um, so I would um, recommend uh, that we send it to the Commission for full adoption and again this would be for an effective date of September 1. Okay. Any questions or discussion on that? Madam Chair, just to be clear for a gentleman who came all the way from Louisiana, so his question, his answer would be September the 1st. Well, the answer for the state deregulation of September 1, the yeah. answer to the question of when cities, what their timetable is, That's we don't know. Right. Yeah. But, but, but the but state the will be out of booting on September, on September 1. 1. And I've spoken to him about it. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Todd. Thank but you. But the cities are able to regulate now, right? Aren't they? Or do they have to wait till September 1? I have I have taken yeah. some questions from yes. some cities and they are preparing to do it now. There are some cities that are booting, um, but I think most of the major metropolitan areas are waiting till September one. Okay. And the question with that, because a lot of them do further regulate, and, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The question with that is about the licensing, and they're gearing up for the licensing the license. portion. Of it. Got it. That's right. Okay. Very good. Madam and Chairman, or I'm sorry. I apologize, Mr. Lawson, for uh, but I hope you got your questions Absolutely. answered. Good. Very good. Uh, I. Um, work for the Houston Police Department, as you know, and I can tell you that we have uh, issued licenses for booting companies in the past and will continue to do so, mm -hmm. and we are in the process of a complete overhaul of our booting ordinance to allow uh, for this particular instance. Uh, and, sir, I'd, I would tell you to consult with the, uh, the Austin Police Department. They may be able to answer your questions better. Thank you. And, and at the risk of him sending me an angry email. Jason Redburn is the person at the city of Austin <laughs> okay. that is handling the booting issues. He's called me. I've talked to him several okay, times. So good. he would be the he would be the contact over there so that people listening, you Jason know you Redburn. have somebody to, to talk to over there. Jason Redburn is is the gentleman over there who's handling Very the turnover. Okay. Would you like to make a motion? Do we have a motion to um, approve send these to the commission? Jeremy Clark, I make the motion. Have a second? I'll second Amy Milstead. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay. Thank you. These will Good be deal. presented to the commission then, and the next meeting <coughs> is, do, do you all know the next meeting for the commission? July 20th? 20th. And that'll be okay. presumably streamed live as well, if you'd like to watch that. So that will be effective September 1, September if approved one, by the commission. Presuming that they adopt it and don't okay. have any further questions or changes that they'd like to make. Very good. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is appointment of vehicle towing enforcement plan work group, which that is um, what I'd like to do is go through the penalty matrix again and make sure our penalties are not out of line since our penalties are so large compared to the other TDLR programs. Um, we've done this at least once before, maybe twice. I can't remember. But um, would you like to say something? Good afternoon, I'm Madam Chair. Ron Foster with Enforcement Division. Not really. Just wanted to make sure I was available in case okay. you had a question. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Michael's still in Houston? <laughs> no, He's not back yet? He's not running to get up here. <laughs> Uh, the, the enforcement plan is the the um, what we the document that we use to to give guidance to the prosecutors in order to determine what the penalty is. They're not just pulling that out of the air. So um, the violations are or organized there in classes, usually from A to G H or something like that, in order of seriousness. So just as the uh, chair was saying, at any time you may go and revisit that, and you can move things up around, up and down. You may also decide that it's appropriate to adjust the penalties or the penalty ranges that are used. So if you're going to do that, um, we would need a few of you guys to, to be on that work group and we'd have one of our work, uh, one of our prosecutors, if not one, maybe two of them actually uh, assisting on that and leading the charge to make sure that work got organized. A lot of times it can be handled through telephone conferences, but you're also welcome to show up um, here at North Campus and we can work on it together in person and teleconference others in. So we just need to okay. get some of you guys together to do that. Okay, I've got, um, like to appoint myself, 
Jeanette Rash, Tasha Mora, and Jimmy Zolke. If nobody has any objections. Jimmy, are you okay with that? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, I know Jeanette is. Tasha's not here, so she doesn't get a choice. So that's our work group. And we will uh, be setting up meetings to go through that. Okay. That's right. Enforcement will spearhead that. We'll, okay. we'll have a point of contact, probably be Chris Rossi, Very our good. analytics guy right now. He'll be reaching out to set those meetings up with you guys in the future, Very okay? Good. Thank you. All right, thanks. Agenda item I, discussion, review of, and possible recommendations for BSF Form 11. We get Todd again. <laughs> and Elizabeth. Your second act. <laughs> and we are up here, but I'm going to defer to our Deputy Executive Director, Carla James. Okay. Well, I, Todd, I'm not sure I was ready to be deferred to. <laughs> so. Um, I'm a, Elizabeth, if you don't mind stepping in and having yeah. a discussion so, about this. So I believe the ongoing discussion has been um, whether, mm -hmm. whether or not to amend the VSF Form 11 to include um, the location that the cars are being taken to and or a phone number that the consumer can call in order to uh, find out where their vehicle was taken. Um, we have previously discussed that um, we have looked at and spoken with TDI and looked at um, several examples of insurance policies and that although <coughs> consumers may not be aware, um, insurance policies do typically contain a provision which allows the insurance agent um, to go in and to pick up their car if they decide that it's been totaled out. Um, that often is overlooked by consumers. but. All of the insurance policies that I've had the opportunity to look at have contained that provision that by signing your agreement with the insurance company, you are agreeing to allow them to pick up the car. That is why those insurance agency, agents then go in and they are able to sign that the consumer has given consent. The consent is not required to be verbal. Um, the consent is just consent in some way, shape, or form. So we have discussed that at a previous meeting. Um, but I believe based on the comments and the discussion here today, there is still ongoing concern about whether or not we should amend the form. Well, yes. the, Madam um, Chair, I, I've worked really hard on this, and I have a document to pass out because I did, I did have a meeting uh, along with C.J. Treadway and Ken Almer with the Department of Insurance and discussed the form with them and what they thought the form did and what they expected that the form would do. And this also has one of their recommendations for sure. So I wanted to pass that out to you. And if you'll add, I did miss add on number three, uh, the location of the vehicle and the phone number of the tow company. Jeanette, Mary Winston, if, if I can uh, interrupt really quickly. Okay. This agenda item is correctly noticed because it does say discussion or review of and possible recommendations, right. which Jeanette is offering. However, none of us have seen the recommendations, so if Madam Chair would like to take a quick recess so we could just everybody take a look see. Okay, let's take a 10-minute uh, okay. break okay. and be back. It's 3 o'clock. Let's be back at 3.10.
I'd like to call the Towing and Storage Advisory Board meeting back to order. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. Um, we are ready to talk about agenda item I and Ms. James. Madam yeah. Chair, Carla James, TDLR. After our, our brief discussion outside of the meeting uh, about VSF uh, for 11, Form 11, uh, we're going to propose to you to let the department uh, look into this just a tiny bit further, have a discussion with the Department of Insurance, and come back to you with some information and potentially a proposal to um, address this situation. We want to make sure that both agencies are on the same page and uh, maybe we can get back to you all quickly and uh, get this issue resolved. Okay. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda are recommendations for agenda items for next meeting. So guess what's on it? <laughs> it should be, yes. Okay. Uh, VSF Form 11 discussion. Our relocation rules. We will hopefully send those to the commission next meeting and a work group report on the enforcement plan. Is there anything else that y'all would like added at this time? Or considered to be added later. <coughs> Madam Chair, when do you suspect <coughs> the next meeting to be? I'm sorry, James. That's the next agenda item. James had something. I, I was going to say, if we just make sure that we do see the removal of anything to do with booting, just ensure that that went through. Okay. Yeah, we'll get an update on that, I'm sure. Phil. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other agenda items? And we can always add some later. If you ha think of something, email me and we'll get that well, on the agenda. So if the next I don't get the, I mean, I have to get the survey and on the environmental fee before I can move forward on that. So okay, that's let me why know. I asked about the length of the meeting because when I get it, then I'll have to do a lot of work on it. Okay. okay. Um, the last agenda item is the date and time of the next meeting. So um, Elizabeth, what are you thinking as far as the rules? So I'd like to give, um, a reasonable amount of time for us to get these rules re um, the um, edits to it won't take very long it's um, the internal review process that we have to go through so I would suggest either the latter part of July like the last week in July or the first two weeks in August Christine when is the Commission meeting in August or is there one there is not one. okay so if we do something in August, um, hopefully we would get it to the board or to the commission in their October meeting. Is that correct? Uh, we probably have a September. We might have a September meeting, but there's no confirmed date on that. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking with vacations. Oh, September 7th, excuse me. I'm told the next commission meeting um, in the fall, the first one in the fall would be September 7th. Okay. I know I've got some travel coming up. I'm sure other board members do as well for the summer. Um, I'm thinking maybe September. Does anybody have any time in July or August? To, I, I mean, like, I've got I like September as well. Okay. And I know you guys have vacations going on as well. So we don't take vacations. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, Neither do I. I, I would have a hard time down. squeezing it in, in in July or August, actually. Well, Madam Chair, we have the 10th and 17th of September. On, uh, September, yes. Those are both Mondays. Is that all we have? <laughs> I know Mondays are hard for some of us. Uh, the week of the 10th, um, we have the 11th and 13th, which is a Tuesday and a, a Thursday. And then any preferences? Eleventh or thirteenth? <coughs> Anybody? Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday the eleventh. I won't be able to do that. I will be in Scottsdale, but I'm available the next week. But you can certainly have it without me. Okay. Everybody else available on the eleventh? Yes. Okay. Do you have a time, Madam Chair? A what? A time that you would prefer? Morning or afternoon? Morning. Morning. Okay. 
morning for sure. Okay. Um, with that, that's the last item on our agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion to adjourn. Amy, Amy Milstead. Milstead. James Spears, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, everyone.